<clears throat> Hi, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to a new live event with Career Foundry. How to get started in UX design in seven steps. I'm Belinda, Junior Steven Manager here at Career Foundry, and today I have the great pleasure to welcome back again to the events channel, Gaila Thompson. Hi, Gaila. Hi, great to be here. Thank you, great to, to have you here. Um, so Gaila will introduce herself uh, later before the presentation, but I would like to tell you a little bit about her. Uh, Gaila is a UX researcher at Nestle Purina, and among other things, she has been a career specialist and a UX design graduate, both with Career Foundry. She has already hosted other webinar with us, speaking about UX design and career change. She is a great expert in the field, so it's a great uh, pleasure to have her today with us. While people are joining, please let us know where you are watching us from and maybe why you are interested in a career change into UX design in the chat on the right hand side. Uh, we would love to make this as interactive as possible, so please feel free to drop any comment you would like to share with us. I would like to introduce you to Career Foundry. Career Foundry is the online school for your career change into tech. We guide you from complete beginner to job ready professional in UX and UI design and help you land your first job in the field. We are not any old school. Our programs are so flexible that you don't need to quit your job to change your career. You get regular one-to-one -one mentorship from not one, but two industry experts. And if you don't land a job within 180 days of graduation, we refund your tuition. And this is our job guarantee. Please let me also tell you a few of our house rules. This webinar will be recorded and we will send the recording out tomorrow via email for those who are registered in Big Marker. If you have any question for Gaila, please drop them in the chat and we will cover them at the Q&A after the presentation. And if you have any question for, um, about career funding programs, I recommend you book a call with one of our program advisors. They will be very happy to speak with you. They will answer all of your questions and even provide you with further information. And with that said, uh, let's start the fun part. I'll see you after the presentation to cover all of your questions together with Gaila. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, Gaila, the floor is yours. Enjoy all it. Right. Thank you. Yeah, so just to tell you a little bit about myself, I am a UX researcher at Purina and I specialize in IoT products. So if you've never heard of that, it stands for Internet of Things. And what that means is a physical device is connected to a digital app. So think of your smart products, your smart doorbell, your smart refrigerator, smart light bulbs. Um, and that's what I do, only it's for pet products. I'm also the author of How to Land Your First UX Job. So if you're interested in that, you can always look that up on Amazon. And as she mentioned, I'm a career changer. I was in education for many years and I got interested in UX design and did a lot of research and I landed with Career Foundry. One of the best decisions I've ever made. So I'm a Career Foundry graduate and I was also a career specialist or a career uh, mentor for students who graduate from Career Foundry. So it's just a little bit about me. So today we're going to talk about how to get started in UX design in seven steps. So the first one is training. This is super important. The training that you choose to pursue will really impact what happens after you complete your training? Can you land that job? So I broke this down into uh, several areas to consider when you're looking for the right school. I highly recommend you find a program where you can try it out first. I did this, this is a screenshot from Career Foundry. I actually took this free day, uh, free six day short course because I knew I was interested in UX design, but I still wasn't quite sure it was right for me. 
And I was pretty nervous about leaving education because I felt very comfortable and confident in that area. So this was a big leap. So trying it out really helped me make that decision. The next thing you want to consider is what kind of training you will receive. So a lot of schools do theoretical training. They teach you about theory uh, and you learn a lot and that's important. But what's most important is that hands-on learning. When you come out of school, you need to have hands-on learning so you can go straight into the workforce, get that job. One of the great things about Career Foundry is you do get the theory, all of that, but you get a lot of hands-on learning and training, which is super important when, when choosing the right school. The next thing you want to look for in your school is whether or not they have mentors. I know I keep plugging Career Foundry, but it's been such a wonderful, amazing experience for me. And one of the reasons why is when I went through the uh, training, I had a tutor that helped me with all of my lessons, gave me amazing feedback, and I could book as many video calls with my tutor as I wanted to. And then once I completed a big project, I was a, the whole time I was assigned a mentor, but when I completed a big project, the mentor who was uh, very knowledgeable, an expert UX designer would give me amazing critical feedback and we could go back and forth via email. And I also was able to book as many calls with my mentor as I wanted to. And I took advantage of both of these. I had so many calls with my tutors and my mentor. Um, so make sure that mentorship is built in when you're looking for the right school. The next thing you want to so the consider is, will you walk away with a portfolio and what does that look like? Will it just be one case study that's on Behance or will it be an actual portfolio with multiple case studies? I know when I graduated Career Foundry, I had three projects that I could showcase immediately in my website. So make sure when you choose a school that you walk away with case studies. That's really important when it comes to getting hired. And the next thing to consider is whether or not you will find support once you graduate from the program. You really need uh, help in this area usually because it can be quite challenging and you might feel insecure or nervous or afraid and not quite sure how to navigate that process. So a career specialist, which is a seasoned coach, can help you with your resume, your, your cover letter, your interviewing skills, your networking skills, all of the things that you need to actually land that job. So these are really important things to consider if you're looking to, to dive into UX and you're not sure which school to go with. The second thing you wanna do is focus on your strengths. So when I was considering uh, a change into UX design, all I could think about is I don't have any design experience. I don't have any graphic design background. I don't know how to use Photoshop or Illustrator. And so it was quite intimidating. However, when you focus on the strengths you do have, that's how you make it in, in this uh, transition into UX design. So some of the skills needed for UX design, if you're not familiar, is user research wireframing and prototyping, visual communication, collaboration, interaction design, information architecture, analytical, analytical skills, and user empathy. All of these things go into UX design, but you don't have to be an expert in all of these. These are all the things that come together for UX design. So once you, once you join a program and start your training, start thinking about which skills are your strongest in and then um, highlight those as you work your way through to getting a job. So when we're looking at this, we want to focus on transferable skills. And so those are skills you're coming to the table with without any technical expertise or training. Because I came from education, some of the skills that I that I brought with me were classroom management, lesson planning, uh, having to produce reports, obviously grading and providing feedback, and I would facilitate discussions and uh, and presentations. 
So some of the core UX design skills that are needed are business acumen, user research, information architecture, common UX deliverables, wireframing and prototyping. When I started UX design, I had none of those core design skills at all. <laughs> I didn't really understand what most of those meant. But what transferable skills are, things that you can transfer over, the skills you have now that translate into UX. So if you look at that middle section, some of the things that I had, because I had the teaching background, I had empathy. I worked with students and parents all the time. I had good communication skills because I had to work with so many different stakeholders. Critical thinking is a big one. And of course, I had to stay organized. So you can start thinking about your work that you do now and what transferable skills you have that can relate to UX design. Next, we'll break this down into UX skills and UI skills. And so these sometimes are confusing. What's the difference? And we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit because they are different. However, you need to know about UI if you're a UX designer and you need to know about UX if you're a UI designer. So if we break this down into UX skills, on the left, you'll see competitor analysis or competitive analysis, whatever you want to call it. Customer analysis and user research. This is a big one. We're always trying to do research to understand where our customers are coming from and what their needs are. Product structure and, and strategy, as well as content development. Prototyping and wireframing, a lot of you probably, when you think of UX and UI, you automatically go to prototyping and wireframing. And of course, testing and iteration. So we always want to inform our design decisions based on testing and feedback from our users. And then you, you see UX designers coordinate with UI designers and with developers. I uh, am in meetings every day with UX designers, UI designers, and developers. So collaboration is a really big piece with UX. And then you have analysis and iteration. And if you want to break down the UI skills to help you understand the differences, UI still needs to understand UX the process, the research, what's involved, because they, they are interconnected. UI, you have uh, customer analysis is a big part of what you do and design research, as well as branding and graphic development. So if you love anything to do with graphic design or visual design, this, this is a great route to go. Um, they also involved in user guides and storylines, as well as UI prototyping, which could be different than, and usually is different than UX prototyping, because it's usually high fidelity, very polished and, and beautiful. They also work with interaction design and animation, as well as responsiveness. So adapt, adaptation to all device screen sizes. So you think of your website, your tablet, and your phone, the design looks nice on all of those, all the different screen sizes. And of course, they also work with developers. And how these overlap, the three main themes would be design thinking, being aware of user needs, and really the end goal is produce a product that is seamless and delights users. So one way to know you have great UX and UI is that you never hear anything about it, which <laughs> it's a little counterintuitive, but what we do hear about is when things go wrong. So if there are no complaints and it works really well, it's seamless, nobody thinks about that. And that's great UX and UI. Another thing you can think about is UX research skills. So at the bottom, this is basically what I do as a UX researcher. I go through a discovery process where I and doing research and creating personas and trying to understand who the users are for this particular product or this particular feature. And then I explore what else is out there and I come up with a very targeted user audience for testing. And then I go through testing and then we listen. Take that feedback that, that you're getting from the users I listen and I present that information 
to the product team, which is the product manager, the UX designer, the UI designer, the developer. Uh, so this is uh, not always this way, but this is a typical day or week for a UX researcher. So when you're focusing on your strengths, think about what you have that you bring to the table. If you're brand new, really focus on those transferable skills. If you're just getting into it, you may find that you, some things are really easy and some things are more challenging. I would focus on your strengths while you're building up anything that you need to work on that might be a weakness. Next, you want to improve your UI skills. Now, this is something I didn't want to hear when I was a UX designer. <laughs> I, uh, I am not a strong visual designer. And so this was really overwhelming and intimidating for me. But when it comes to getting hired, people look at your portfolio. And if it looks beautiful, if you're incorporating great uh, UI skills, that helps you get hired no matter if you're looking for a UX designer position, UX research, you still need to work on your UI. So how do you do that? I would explore different design systems. There are three or four major ones out there, material design and some others. I suggest focusing on a specific design system and just learn it really well. Get familiar with the others, but really try to um, conserve your energy and focus on one at a time. The next big one is designing for accessibility. And this has come into play in the last few years because the idea is you want to reach as many users as possible. And that means people who may have uh, vision issues or auditory challenges. And how do we make this as easy as possible for all age groups, for all walks of life? And we do that by designing for accessibility. So I would definitely dive into that no matter which path you decide to take. That's super important and will be a big part of you getting hired, being knowledgeable in this area and showcasing that you know that through your work. The next thing you wanna do is experiment with design tools. There are a lot out there and it can be quite overwhelming. Um, if you have to choose only one, the hot design tool right now is Figma. Figma and FigJam are, are used by almost every company out there. Adobe XD is another good one. And you might even start off with something like Balsamic for um, low fidelity, fidelity and the fidelity wireframing. But if you have to choose only one, Figma is really the way to go for, for today's market. I highly suggest get criti critical feedback from UX professionals. And of course, I, I love the Princess Bride, so I had to throw this in here. Mentorship. I do not think it means what you think it means. And the reason I included this is because a lot of times when you're a student or a recent graduate, you make a lot of great friendships and connections with other students or recent graduates. And it's great to get feedback from them but they are not experienced yet. They may not see things that a more experienced professional would see. You also want a UX person to give you critical feedback. That's a big part of UX design. You want that feedback. You want to know what's not working. You want to know why it's not working. So coming to the table with an open mindset and a curious mindset is really important for UX design. Get the feedback that you need Take that back with you, think about it, and figure out how to make it better, how to improve your skill set. And if you're um, a little sensitive to feedback, just know everything is really about how do we make this a better product for the user. It's not about you personally, it's about the end result, which is always about the user experience. And lastly, on your UI schools, skills, um, you want to practice. I can't emphasize practice enough. I suggest setting aside time every day to focus only on your UI skills. Maybe it's just 20 minutes a day. And if you're not a strong visual designer like me, that's not a strength of mine. 
look what's out there. What do you gravitate towards? What looks nice to you? What's interesting to you? And then use that as inspiration to create your own designs. Don't have to do this from scratch, from nothing. Look and see what's out there, but practicing, try to mimic something that you love and you want to get good at this and you want to get to be uh, efficient where you can do this fairly quickly without feeling too much pressure with that time crunch. Next, you want to specialize in one area. And this is extremely challenging when you're just <laughs> finishing school. You may think, I don't know what I wanna do or what I'm good at. And it's really important to choose one of the following. So when you choose a specialization, you have UX design, UI design, UX research, or UX copywriting. Let's talk about UX design. So what goes into UX design? User research and testing are a big part of that. Wireframing and prototyping, you absolutely will be doing that and the information architecture. Competitive research, and that, that could be yours. Um, Sometimes things are divided in, depending on the company, into separate sections where user research, testing, and competitive research is done by the UX researchers. But a lot of times the UX designer is involved in all of these things. And then, of course, interaction design. What does that look like? So if you love these things, you gravitate toward these, or you're really strong in these areas, then UX design is the way to go. Another area, of course, you could focus on is UI design. So if you love typography, I, I actually do love typography. I think it's really fun. Um, that's my doorbell. Uh, visual design, you love that. User psychology. Animations are fun for you. You read about color and color theory. You're great at seeing things and putting the right colors together. And then, of course, aesthetics. So this is what you want to focus on if you love UI design in these aspects. Next is user research. So let's say you don't feel confident in UI design, but you love the research and testing aspect of UX. You could focus on UX research. So that's all about looking at competitors, building out personas, creating uh, test plans. It's a lot of solo work while collaborating with other people. So you get a lot of input, but then you go work by yourself to produce all of these things, these test plans, you build things out, and then you execute testing. And presentations are a big part of UX research. So you compile all of your results, into a presentation and you share that with the entire product team. So if this is interesting to you, then UX research might be the way to go. Oops, it looks like um, this is, we had some glitches earlier. Uh, so it looks like this is not the updated uh, slideshow. So mentorship should actually say UX writing. Um, so Let's look at the difference in copywriters and UX writers. So on the left, you see use sexy words to attract customers. That's the copywriting side. But a UX writer is different. They use simple words to explain things. A copywriter is sales oriented, where a UX writer is product oriented. And that's a huge difference when it comes to uh, writing. Copywriters typically work with the marketing team, while UX writers work with the designers and the product team. And copywriters tell stories, but UX writers share conversations. They both work alone. So if you have a writing background and you gravitate towards writing and you love it, practice UX writing. There are a lot of things out there to practice. There's there's a UI daily challenge. There's a UX daily challenge. There's a U UX writing daily challenge. There are a lot of ways to practice all of these things that are free and easy for you to learn and grow. Next, you want to showcase your work in your case studies and in your portfolio. So sometimes those are used interchangeably, 
But I typically think of a case study as a case study that's an, more of an in-depth over, uh, overview of what you did on a project. And I think of a portfolio as all of these case studies put together, and it's typically on a website. So when you look at your case studies, you really want to have at least three or four case studies. You want your first case study to be your best work. People almost always click on the first case study that they see. So it's not about the most recent, it's about the best work that you have that you put out there. How do we do that? Storytelling through imagery versus storytelling through words. So in a case study, you want it to be where we can quickly go through it. If I can go through your case study with no words, just through your images and have a very good understanding of what you did, that's a great case study. Typically recruiters spend an average of two to three minutes on your website total. So that's looking at your about page, your landing page and going through a case study. It's not very much time. So if you can tell the story through imagery and fewer words, that's a better way to go. Next, you wanna focus on UX, UI or UX research. No matter what, you will have some UX, some UI and some research involved in any case study, but you want to focus on one of those. This is an example of a case study that I recently put together. I have good information over here. I did not do a SWOT analysis. I didn't show that anyway. I did, but I didn't show it. I didn't write out a bunch of information about competitive analysis. What I did is I created an image here that shows you the competition, which implies that I did my research on all of these companies, but I'm not writing paragraphs to talk about it. I grasped this, or I gathered this information here, and then I just put three quotes that support this information that I have here. So I'm throwing, I'm showing through imagery, but the focus is on UX research. So let's look at a poor example and a good example. So when you look at this, it's called Perfect Properties, delivering home buyers a real estate tool that allows them to make informed decisions on one of the biggest purchases of their lives. All right, so one of the biggest purchases of their lives Let's look at this image. That is not a property I would want to buy. <laughs> Maybe if you were going to flip the property and you're, con you're in construction or um, you, you, know, you can do all of that, but most people want to see a beautiful home. They don't want to see a, an image like this. Taking that a step further, if this is a case study, I don't even want to see a home. I want to see mock-ups. I want to see mobile or web uh, website mock-ups of your best work of your final product, final, final mock-ups, not an image like this. Over here, we have the challenge and the font is super small compared to this font up here. So we've got one, two, three, four fonts. These are left aligned. The paragraph is left aligned. But this part here, the challenge is not left aligned. So there are a lot of things going on here that can be improved upon. The next one is a good example. And the reason I like this is because it shows before and after. Here's the before. It's a quick blurb, easy to understand what they were doing, giving you feedback on testing. And here's the after. Here's what they did and why. And now they're showing you before and after this before and after. So you can see the changes that were made and all of these were made based on user feedback. Designs were, were created because users said this is working or this is not working. It's a great way to showcase your work in a case study. Next, not everybody likes to hear this, but you need a portfolio website. So if you're new to creating a website, that's fine. You can uh, build up those skills. When you get hired as a UX designer, you are expected to have at least a basic understanding of web design. Probably you won't be doing any of that, but you'll be working with people who do and you need to understand the differences in designing for a website 
versus mobile. And that means you need to get, get in there and learn how to create a website. If you're not sure where to go, um, there, Squarespace. Squarespace is a really easy one to get started. It's very basic, super easy, very helpful. It's got a drag and drop uh, option on there. And if you know a little CSS, you can use that in there to, to further customize it. If you already know some coding, you might go with Webflow. Webflow is a, it's a hot topic right now, and a lot of people are getting hired because they know Webflow really well. So figure out where you are in your learning curve of creating a website and jump in there and get that started. One of the things that, that we see is a lot of people just want to show off their Behance page. I don't recommend this at all. It, um, number one, it doesn't show that you know how to use a website or create a website, which is super important. You don't have a big about section and other information. You can't really personalize it very much. And also, unfortunately, sometimes people think that you're just being lazy, that you didn't go to the trouble to create a website. And when you think about how competitive the market is, you want to be as competitive as possible. And the way to do that is to have an amazing website. So Behance is a no-no when it comes to trying to uh, apply for jobs and get hired. You also want to have a personalized domain. The best thing to do is have your name.com. It's not always possible. If it's not, you can create something similar or like designs by you or UX designs by your name. You can personalize it, but it wants, we want it to be memorable and we want it to be something that is related to you specifically. The last thing you want to do is you want to UX your website. Is it responsive? So a lot of, a lot of people, especially since COVID, are working from home and they're checking all of their emails or checking uh, portfolios from their phones. It needs to be responsive. So you want to make sure it looks great on the phone and on a desktop. You also want to look at the layout at your hierarchy. Does it look nice? What about the negative space, the white space? What does that look like? This is so incredibly important because when they go to your website, it's the first thing that represents your work. So you want it to look good. It doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to have animations, but it needs to have good hierarchy and uh, good color, good colors that work together. So the conundrum is, how do you get hired without experience? And how do you get experience without getting hired? <laughs> I've been through all of this. So anything that I'm, I'm recommending today or, or giving you ideas on, I've experienced firsthand. And it's really difficult and, and frustrating when you get out of school and you go looking for a job and they want you to have like two years experience as an entry level designer. So the way to get around that is to volunteer. Volunteer gives you, volunteering gives you real world experience. And then you take that experience away. You, you apply it to your next project. You have that on your resume. You have that on your LinkedIn and you have new portfolio pieces. So what do I recommend? There are a lot of places out there that you can, you can volunteer for. I know when I volunteered, um, I volunteered for an app at the very beginning of COVID called COVID Watch. And I got a ton of UX research experience in that that I did not have. So that was different than uh, what's available today. But right now, the hot place to go is TechFleet. And if you notice, it says, get ready for the real world. No portfolio required. So that means if you're still in school and don't have your portfolio put together 100%, you've got something there, maybe a case study or two, but it's not quite ready to go. TechFleet will, will let you join their team. You can gain real experience in UX. You get to work with the product team and the developers. So a lot of times when you start interviewing for UX design positions, they say, do you have any experience working on a team or do you have any experience working with developers? And if you do this, you can say, yes, yes, I do. 
So why is this a great option for volunteering? As I mentioned, you get to work on a team. So you have a UX design team. It's usually a UX researcher, UI re uh, designer, and UX designer. You have a product owner or product manager in that team. And you have a project management team. So sometimes people get confused, product manager versus project manager. So the product manager is overseeing and working as a liaison with the UX team and the development team, and also making sure projects and everything are going according to plan from the project management team. A project manager is scheduling everything, is creating tickets in JIRA, is a lot of times the Scrum Master. You might have heard of Scrum Master. If you're not familiar with that, you should look it up. It's a big part of what you'll be working with. And uh, Agile, if you're not familiar with that, you definitely want to look that up. So you get to work on this amazing team, different teams, and, uh, and take that experience with you. As I mentioned, you get to work in an agile environment. So agile means you're constantly iterating and coming back to the table and evaluating where you are. You don't wait until a project is completely finished to think about whether or not it's going to work. So typical agile just means you plan, then you design and develop, and then you test. Once you get past testing, you deploy and you review. Is this working? Let's go back. We may have to go back through this again, plan, design, develop, test. And eventually, once you go through this enough times, you end up launching the product. So working in an agile environment is important to have that experience. And that is often a uh, question during an interview. And of course, you get to walk away with a new portfolio piece a new case study, which I would list first as your first case study because it's real world experience. List that first on your resume, list that first on your LinkedIn profile. See how we're doing on time. Yeah, we're good. Another one out there is called Democracy Lab. You might want to check that out as well. One of the great things about Democracy Lab is they have so many projects that you can apply for and join. At the time I put this presentation together, there were 31 UX design projects available, and there are lots of different subjects uh, and, and topics that you can join uh, for that. So like I said, this is, I apologize, this is an old uh, template that wasn't updated, um, but this should say Democracy Lab still. So one of the great things about them is they host in-person and virtual events. So since COVID, a lot of the, before that, most things were in person, but since then, a lot of them are now virtual. So it's really great with Democracy Lab because they do host these. And again, you walk away with a new portfolio piece similar to the Tech Fleet experience. Step seven, this is the last step. Networking, super, super important. Start telling everybody right now, I'm a UX designer. This is what I do. It might feel weird. It might feel uncomfortable, but you want to tell everybody that you're a designer right now. So you start to feel that. And then you start to let people know, and you will be very surprised at how many people will be interested in talking to you or know other designers that they can connect you with. So there's online networking and in-person networking. The number one place to go for online networking is LinkedIn. Super important to spend time on your LinkedIn profile. I don't have this as a bullet point, but your picture needs to be there. We want to see you up close. No party pictures, no group pictures, no hobby activity pictures. A, a nice professional picture of yourself. You don't have to have a professional portrait photographer do this. Just get a friend to take a picture of you on the phone and, and put that up. Next, as I have here, is title. Title is super important, and this goes back to specialization. As you see on mine, all I have is I'm a UX researcher, and I have IoT because I specialize in IoT uh, U, uh, UX research. I oftentimes, and I was guilty of this, I did it. So anything I'm talking about, I've already done and uh, learned from, from those mistakes or, or different paths that I took. 
but a lot of times I see people who say they're a UX designer, a UI designer, a UX researcher, a visual designer, and then whatever current profession that they have. I don't know anybody who is good at all of those things. I know people who are strong UX designers with great UI skills. I know amazing visual designers who know some UX and research. I know a lot of amazing UX researchers who understand UX UI, but I don't know anybody who is good at all of those things. So you wanna find one, one title and tailor your portfolio to that, your resume to that, your LinkedIn profile. Next, a lot of times this is overlooked is your background on your LinkedIn profile. And I do see some people put beautiful landscapes there. And that, you know, that's great if you want to be a portrait or a landscape photographer, something like that. But if you're looking to be a UX designer, put something here that that shows everybody you're a UX designer without even having to look at your title. Put some uh, mock-ups, some mobile wireframes, something like that in your background. So as soon as somebody looks at your page, they think, oh, this must be a UX person. And then they come to your title. Oh, yes, this is definitely a UX person. Don't forget to fill out your experience. Sometimes we just put the, the name of the company and where we're working. But you want to include all of this in here. It, it pulls keywords when recruiters are looking for you. And this is a newer thing on LinkedIn. If you haven't done it, you might want to go back and update your LinkedIn profile. But you can now add skills to this specific uh, position. So on my skills, I could have listed a lot. Instead, I chose three main topics. Internet of Things or IoT qualitative and quantitative research methodologies and UX research. And all of these things go together and they summarize all of my experience here. So don't forget to add your experience and your skills. You also want to start to grow your network, super important. The goal is 500 connections or more. And that may seem really overwhelming, if especially if you're brand new to, UX, uh, to LinkedIn. Start reaching out to UX people. Say, hey, yeah, I'm new to the industry, but I am looking to grow my network and I would love to connect with you as a seasoned UX professional. Write a simple note and most of the time they'll accept that. And then you can start following their posts and start liking their information that they post. Start commenting on the posts. That's how you start to network. So don't forget that it's super important. Uh, another thing you can network in person is meetup.com. So if you're not familiar with that, there are thousands of meetups that are UX centric. A lot of them are in person, but again, since COVID, a lot of them have shifted to remote. So if you are in an area where you don't have a lot of UX opportunities, look at some bigger cities and join some communities where you can participate remotely. Another in-person uh, thing that you can do is uh, Eventbrite events. Most of them are free. I will say I've never once paid for any sort of meetup or Eventbrite event, um, but there are some good ones and there are some that you can pay for if you feel inclined to do that. But if you're looking to network in person, meetup and Eventbrite are great ways to go. So, Lots of information covered today. We'll do a quick summary and then we'll open it up for questions. So first, focus on your training and find a good school. Look at your strengths. Don't think about all the things you don't have. Focus on your strengths and move forward with that mindset. Don't forget to specialize UX design, UX research, UI, or UX writing. Choose one. And, and if you're not sure which way to go, I would choose either what you are strongest in or what you love the most. So sometimes those are two different things. So maybe you're really strong in something because of your previous uh, career, but you love some other, some other aspect and you're gravitating towards that. Choose one 
and become a specialist in that area. And again, don't forget to practice your UI skills. You want to get good at that. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be an expert UI designer, but you want people to look to look at your work and, and understand what you're doing and say, hey, this is great work. And a lot of times that comes down to UI. Don't forget to tell your case studies through stories, through imagery. Not a lot of text. If it's too much text, they won't read it and they won't get a good understanding of all the hard work you put into that case study. And again, to gain that real world experience, you want to volunteer. There are a lot of volunteer opportunities out there. You can just Google it uh, or you can go with Tech Fleet or Democracy Lab. And as we just spoke about, or just talked about, reach out and grow your network. So that concludes the today's uh, presentation. Are there any questions? Hi, Gaila, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you so much for a great presentation. It's been super insightful, um, plenty of super good resources and very valuable information. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us and your experience. So we are going to open um, the Q&A session now. Um, are you ready, Gaila? Yes, I'm ready. That's great. Um, I think the people, uh, before we start the Q&A, I would like to share with you, I think the people has enjoyed a lot of the presentation and we have some feedback from Samuel in LinkedIn. I think he received your career services and he said, um, hi, Gaila. Gaila was my career advisor and her advice and insight was huge, a huge part of me landing a UX, uh, my UX and UI uh, dream job. So oh, that's, that's really sweet. Hi, I haven't talked to him in a while. <laughs> yeah, we, we send greetings to Samuel and thank you for sharing this um, with us. So I have I, I had many questions from my side, but I think you cover all of them in your presentation. So let's go straight to the question from the audience. Okay. Um, and I have one question from Chan. I think it's uh, nice to open the, um, the Q&A session because he's kind of new for the field and he would like to know what what are the difference between web development and, U and UX and UI design? Ah, oh, that's a good question. So first of all, let's separate web design from web development because sometimes those are used interchangeably, but those are really two very different things. So web design is the layout, the hierarchy, the colors, the, um, the, the way it looks, the visual imagery of it. Development, web development would be the coding of it, coding things in CSS or JavaScript, which those are very different. So when I mentioned Squarespace, that's design. You're not using any coding. It's a drag and drop design program. Coding is more web flow and, and personalizing. So once we separate those, I think that helps. And then UX is, is different because it's focusing on the user, the experience of the user, what's working, what's not, uh, what are what we call pain points or points of friction, what's frustrating. And UX helps solve that. And once they solve for that, it's handed off to UI design, which then makes those designs beautiful, and lovely to, to look at. So UX is about how it interacts with the user and UI is about the aesthetics. Great. Um, thank you, Gaila. And thank you, Chan, for your question. Um, let's move on to the next question. We have a question from James and he's asking, do you need a school or can you learn these skills through self-taught courses? Mm. Yeah, I think to, depending on who you ask, you're going to get a different answer from from everybody. Um, is it possible to learn on your own? I, I'm not going to say it's not possible. Of course, anything is possible. But 
I think that if you do that, there's a saying, you don't know what you don't know. So I think you wouldn't even know what you should be doing or should be learning besides whatever you can find in, in, in Google articles. And I think it'd be quite challenging. I highly recommend a, a program that you go through. They guide you. They teach you all of these aspects. There's a lot of things that I had no idea about UX, even though I've done a lot of research. Um, but going through Career Foundry helped prepare me for my first job. So I do highly recommend a, an actual training program. Great. Thank you. Got a nice insight. Um, so the next question we are going to cover is from Sophie. And she's asking how hard is to find a job after she get the education required? Um, because she heard that the market is oversaturated. So and, and a follow up question, I guess, is will it be able to work internationally? I think she's from Germany and she's asking if she could work for, for example, an American client. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So two part question. The first part of that, how hard is it to get into to get a job when you finish your training? And I think that that comes down to how hard you're willing to work. So a lot of times once you finish your training, your schooling, you're so excited and you put together a portfolio, you have your case studies, everything's ready to go. And you're probably exhausted because it's intense. It's a lot of learning. It, you know, it, it's, it's a lot to take in and to remember, recall. And so then a lot of times we get lazy and we're not getting calls and we don't want to go in and update our portfolios, but really want to continue. You want to just go through that UX process of your own portfolio, go back and update your case studies, change the color scheme, update your UI. If you didn't do enough research, do another round of testing and showcase your research. So it depends on how dedicated you are to that process, because that is, that is your brand. You are the brand. And to do that is to showcase your work in a beautiful and um, an interesting way that shows that you know what you're doing. So if you're not willing to keep going back and, and looking at yourself from a, a critical eye and getting feedback from others, it will be more challenging to land that position. There are a lot of jobs out there, especially since COVID. What happened is a lot of people stopped shopping in stores and they started shopping online. So e-commerce has exploded. There are an infinite number of UX design positions. So I don't think there's any any worry that there aren't enough positions. It is a it is a competitive industry for sure. But if you put in the work, you network and you focus on your portfolio and building your skills, absolutely you can get a job. When it comes to international, I think it depends on the company. On there on the product that I work on, there are about a hundred of us on this one particular product that I work on called Petivity. And we have people in Australia, we have people all over the US, in Spain, in the UK, uh, in, in Mexico, everywhere. So it depends. And we're all on the same team. We all, some people are at headquarters, and then some people, most of us work remotely. So I think it really depends on the company, but there are a lot of opportunities out there for international work. Pretty nice. Thank you, Gaila. And thank you, um, Sophie, for your question. Let's move on to another question from Chan again. And he's asking about companies. I think you have a, a nice insight about this one. Uh, what kind of companies would hire a team of UX and UI designers? And the second question from that part is, do UX and UI designers work on a project based or within a company? Um. Can you say that last part again? Do they work on a product? Yeah, on a work. Um, do UX and UI designers work on a project based or within a company? Yeah. So I, 
I forget the first part of the question. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> That's like, a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, um, we can cover like first one and yeah, let's do that. <laughs> uh, so the first one is: What kind of companies would hire a team of UX and UI designers? Okay, there we go. Now I remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, every company needs UI and UX. If, if they have, if they have an app. They need UX UI. A lot of them, if they even just have a web app and a website, UX UI. All the, anybody out there who's selling products of any kind, whether they're digital products or physical products, they need UX UI and they need developers. So that opens it up to so many different industries. Whatever you're interested in, there are opportunities there. Um, and then can you go to the second part of the, or the next part? <laughs> yes. So now the question is, uh, do UX and UI designers work on a project base or oh. within a company? I guess if you can work outside the company. So it depends on how you, um, how you work. If you're contract, you usually are project based. Um, if you are full time, you're usually within the company. And so you might only work on one particular product or and, and product could mean a lot of things i know but one particular product if you're in contract that's usually how it is um, if you're within an, a company you might just work on one small area you could work you might work six months on one feature of an app or you might be on a smaller company working on the website and the app and the entire ux design process so it's hard to say because there are just so many different opportunities out there. Good. Well, thank you, Gaila. Um, now we are going to cover a few questions. I think this is like um, the really trendy part about, uh, I guess you heard about it already, artificial intelligence. So we have many people asking about that. Um, so we have a question from Jennifer and she's asking, can you talk a little bit about the increasing use of artificial intelligence in certain industry, specifically if UX, if UI or UX is more in danger of being disruptive, replaced first? Mm. Yeah, AI is is big right now and it's not going anywhere. It's only going to grow and, and, and become more involved in, in product development. Uh, we, we have an AI team with, that I work with. Um, it, any of the smart products have AI and at least a very, at the very least a small aspect, maybe that's a big part of how they operate. So AI is huge and AI usually works in conjunction with with product development and UX UI, UX, especially UX research. It's a big part of AI development. What's working, what's not, what do consumers want? Um, so no, no reason to worry about it taking over. It's not going to take over UX. It's what it's going to do is enhance products and the capabilities of products. Yeah. Great, good, thank you, Gaila. <clears throat> okay, uh, so the next question is um, about ChatGPT, and this question comes from Camille, and she said, with the rise of programs like ChatGPT, do you think UX writers will still have a career longevity? Oh... This is just that is so controversial right now. It's just chat GPT. <laughs> so one of the things to keep in mind is the legal aspects of that. A lot of companies are not allowed to use that because number one, they may have things that are that are not being being shared with the public at this time that are confidential if they're working on on future products. And so anything they put into that is public knowledge and they do not want that. Um, so there's a lot of legal aspects that nobody even thinks about when they think of uh, UX writing and chat GPT, but a lot of companies do restrict that completely because of legalities. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. It might help you get ideas to get started on something. If you're, you know, you're 
stuck and, and can't think of something. Um, but I don't see that alleviating UX writing. Definitely. Um, okay, uh, thank you. Um, let's cover a few. I'm mindful of the time, so let's uh, take a couple of more questions. Um, let's give me just a second because we have so many. Thank you, everyone, for posting them. Um, this is a question we don't have name, but I think it's interesting. How can we choose the first project for our case study? Mm. Well, if you go to a good school like Career Foundry, you're going to create that first project in school. And you're going to have help every step of the way with every part of the UX design process as you're creating your case study and your project. So that's why I highly recommend finding a good school versus uh, learning on your own. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Let's take one uh, um, more question from the audience. This is from Stephanie. And she's asking, do you have any other job board suggestions or other methods of finding openings? I guess speaking about finding a job, the job search. Mm. Well, there's UX jobs. Um, there's, it, it was angel list and now it's, it's, I forget the name of it. Um, but if you Google angel list, it will call, I think it's well found, but I'm not, I don't recall exactly. They're great if you want contract work and a lot of them will take newer designers for, for their jobs. It's a lot of this or almost all of them are startups. So that's, that's a good one. I'm trying to think what else I'm blinking and there's so many great ones out there. Uh, if you're into UX research, I think it's called UX research jobs or something like that. So just Google it, but there's, there's a whole bunch of them, but I would, I would definitely look at other job boards besides LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn is so competitive and hundreds of applicants will apply within a day or two for, for a job. So if you look at other job boards, not as many people are applying, which increases your odds of getting hired. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone for all of your questions. Uh, may, I uh, may I ask like the last question of the Q and A from my side, Gaila? Sure. I think it's a nice one. Um, Give me just one second. So I would like to know, so you can share with the audience, how do you stay up to date on the industry trends and changes in the job markets? Yeah, I do a lot of reading. Um, I'm also pretty active on LinkedIn. I'm in a lot of UX groups and a lot of good things are shared. And when something is shared, I read up on it and then I go research it on my own outside of that. Um, I, there are podcasts that you can listen to. I haven't found one that I love, but I know there are podcasts out there. YouTube is another one. I watch a lot of YouTube videos. Um, so definitely just, I always try to make time every week to be learning something new, whether it's through video or reading. Great. Thank you, Gaila. Um, thank you everyone for posting all of your questions. I'm sorry if we didn't address all of them. But Gaila probably will be back to the channel soon. So you will have the chance to ask her more questions. And um, thank you, Gaila, for a great presentation and for answering all of the questions. Um, thank you before, for having me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a great pleasure always, Gaila. Um, <laughs> so before we close the webinar, I would like to tell you about a special discount that we are offering this month. A tuition reduction worth up to $1,370 and €1,195 off the full price of our UX and UI design programs. And if you would like to receive more information, I recommend booking a call with one of our program advisors by simply clicking on the sticky note at the top of the chat that you can see um, on the right part. Please let me also tell you that we have a fantastic blog at Career Foundry run by our team of editors with plenty of great articles about UX, UI design, and so much more topics. 
please also check out the Career Foundry YouTube channel, which has a lot of great video content. And finally, please visit our events page because we have a lot of more upcoming events like this one. Um, um, would you like to say any final words, Kyla, before we close the webinar? I think if you are looking to make that transition, go for it. I don't mean quit your job, but go for it. I was terrified to, to leave education and it's the best decision I made because I am so happy in my career. Great. Thank you, Gaila. We learned so much uh, from you always. Um, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I hope you all have enjoyed and stay tuned for uh, the upcoming webinars. And I'll see you in the next time. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye.